Elon Musk may be the public face of SpaceX, but there are many other incredibly talented people at the company who tend to live in his shadow. One of them is Tom Miller. He might not be well known, but he's a major reason SpaceX has become so successful. This is the story of SpaceX's very first employee, the one who led the design, testing, and construction of the company's rocket engines. Did you ever see the movie October Sky? It's about NASA rocket scientist Homer Hickam. He grew up in West Virginia, and his dad was a coal miner. Basically, if you take that story and change mining to logging, it's the story of my life. That's how Thomas John Muller describes his life. Born in St. Marie's, Idaho, Muller grew up in a small logging town where his father, like many others, worked in the woods. His father hoped Tom would follow the same path, but Tom had different plans. From a young age, he was captivated by rocketry, building and launching Estes model rockets in his backyard. His curiosity and ingenuity only grew. At one point, he even built a rocket using parts from his father's oxyacetylene welder and discovered that adding water increased thrust. Still, life wasn't easy. To pay for college, Muller spent four grueling summers working as a logger. He later earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Idaho in 1985. After graduation, he turned down job offers in Idaho and Oregon, choosing instead to move to California to pursue a career in aerospace. Shortly after arriving, he attended a job fair and landed a role in satellite design. His career quickly evolved, and he soon found himself developing liquid rocket engines, his lifelong passion. In 1992, he earned a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Loyola Marymount University's Frank R. Seaver College of Science and Engineering. Before joining SpaceX, Tom Muller spent 15 years at TRW Inc. to a large conglomerate involved in aerospace, automotive, credit reporting, and electronics. He managed the propulsion and combustion products department, where he was responsible for developing liquid rocket engines. But Muller felt that his ideas were getting lost within such a sprawling corporation, so he began building engines as a hobby. He attached his custom engines to airframes and launched them in the Mojave Desert. At the end of 2001, he began constructing a new liquid-fueled engine, first in his garage and later in a friend's warehouse. After successfully test-firing the engine in 2002, Muller became something of a legend in the amateur rocketry world. His work caught the attention of Elon Musk, who at the time had a big dream about going to Mars, but very little practical knowledge about rockets, especially when it came to building engines. When Musk visited the warehouse and met Muller's group, he quickly realized that Tom wasn't just an enthusiast. He knew everything there was to know about rocket engines from small experimental ones to full-scale orbital class machines. It's still somewhat surprising that Muller chose to join Elon Musk at the time. He was mid-career and later admitted that it was difficult to walk away from the stability he had. But Musk made a strong impression on him with his knowledge, his clear long-term vision, and his ambition. Most importantly, Muller said that even though it was a high-risk move, it was exactly where he wanted to be. Joining a startup was risky, but it also gave him the freedom to do more and push boundaries in a way that wasn't possible before. Muller started working at SpaceX in May 2002 as the founding employee of SpaceX. Over the next few years, Tom Muller led the development of two key engines for SpaceX's first rocket, the Falcon 1, the Kestrel, and the Merlin 1A. The Kestrel was a small pressure-fed engine that powered the upper stage of Falcon 1. It shared a lot of design DNA with the Merlin, including the distinctive Pintle injector, but it was much simpler. With no turbo pumps, it had a straightforward setup that made it light and relatively easy to build. There was a more advanced version, Kestrel 2, in the works that aimed to boost performance and cut down on weight. That project was eventually dropped when Falcon 1 gave way to Falcon 9, which used the more powerful Merlin 1C engine on both stages. The Merlin engine itself turned out to be one of Muller's biggest contributions to SpaceX and one of the keys to the company's success. It is a kerosene and liquid oxygen engine that runs on a gas generator cycle. The design was intentionally kept simple and cost-effective, 
which made it not only affordable to build, but also reusable. That reusability became a central part of SpaceX's mission. Here's a fun backstory. Ever wonder how SpaceX engines got their names? Muller shared the story once, he said, When we first started SpaceX, we just called our booster engine the 60K engine. But after we started running it, Elon told me to come up with a name for it that wasn't numbers and letters like RD-180 or RS-68, etc. One of the people working on the turbo pump from Barbara Nichols was a falconer, and she suggested we name it after a falcon. I thought that sounded good, so I asked her, what are some falcon names? She named off a bunch, and I can't recall them all. But I do remember that the Kestrel is the small one, the Merlin is a medium-sized falcon, and the Peregrine and Gur Falcon are large falcons. I thought a great will name the small second-stage engine Kestrel and the medium-sized engine the Merlin. I knew we would develop bigger engines in the future, so I planned to reserve Peregrine for later. Elon liked the naming, so it stayed. Years later, we started work on a staged combustion engine, which was a different type than Merlin, so I was thinking along the lines of Eagle or something. I eventually came up with Raptor, which is the general definition of birds of prey, including eagles, hawks, falcons, and owls. Anyway, the Merlin engine helped revolutionize spaceflight by being designed with reusability in mind. Developing an engine that can withstand a 170-second burn is no small feat. That duration is long enough to lift a payload into orbit and still survive the return to Earth. But that's exactly what SpaceX achieved. Reusable rockets are what truly put SpaceX on the map. Over time, the company significantly upgraded the Falcon 9's performance. The original version could carry around 9,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Today, the latest Block 5 variant can deliver over 22,800 kilograms, which is more than a 150% increase in payload capacity. Falcon 9 boosters can return to the launch site or land on autonomous drone ships at sea. Each one is designed to be reused up to 10 times before needing major refurbishment. On July 2nd, SpaceX set a new reuse record with the 500th Falcon 9 launch. It marked the 472nd successful first stage landing since December 2015 and the 439th the time a Falcon 9 booster had been reused. With 500 launches completed and 495 of them fully successful, Falcon 9 remains the most launched U.S. rocket in history. But SpaceX's ambition didn't stop there. The team went on to develop a much larger vehicle, powered by a far more powerful engine. That's when Elon asked Tom Miller, what would it take to get 100 tons to Mars? Tom suggested switching the fuel from hydrogen to methane, and it turned out to be the right call. Not only is methane one of the lowest cost fuels per ton to send to Mars and back, but it can also be produced directly on the red planet. Using a chemical process known as the Sabatier reaction, carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere and water from local sources can be converted into methane and oxygen. This method, called in its situ resource utilization, greatly reduces the need to carry fuel from Earth. It also opens the door to long-term missions and eventual colonization by enabling spacecraft to refuel on Mars. For SpaceX's Raptor engine, methane makes sense on many levels. It is relatively dense, which helps keep rocket size and tank volume manageable. It is also an efficient fuel, burns cleanly, and supports the development of highly reusable engines. Methane burns at a moderate temperature, which helps extend engine life, an important factor for a vehicle that needs to fly multiple times. Raptor also uses a cutting-edge full-flow staged combustion cycle. This advanced design includes two pre-burners, one fuel-rich and one oxidizer-rich, each driving separate turbine shafts. The result is an extremely efficient and powerful engine. With this design, Raptor has become one of the highest performing rocket engines ever built. Thomas Miller retired from SpaceX in late 2020, wrapping up nearly two decades with the company. When asked about the standout moments from his time there, he mentioned that the first launch of Falcon Heavy in February 2018 really stood out. That was a real spectacle to see, he said. And honestly, who can blame him? That mission was unforgettable. The double booster landing was nothing short of an iconic moment. 
Thomas Muller is now in a new chapter of his life. While SpaceX continues launching Starship and expanding the Starlink satellite network using propulsion systems he helped design, Muller has turned his attention to a new dream, building his own space company, now known as Impulse Space. Founded in 2021, Impulse has already made significant strides. The company developed an orbital transfer vehicle called Mira, designed to deliver payloads such as cameras, radar systems, and other technology for communications, defense, and scientific research into low Earth orbit. Mira completed its first space mission in November 2023 and has since become a regular shuttle for sending cargo to the edge of space. But Muller is not stopping there. Impulse is currently developing a more advanced in-space vehicle named Helios, which will transport payloads from low Earth orbit to geostationary orbit about 22,000 miles above the equator. Scheduled to launch in 2026, Helios may eventually be capable of reaching as far as Mars. I just realized SpaceX's Starship is going to fly often, and it can take hundreds of tons to low Earth orbit every time it flies, Muller said. My thought was, there is going to be a lot of cargo going to space, and it is going to need to be moved around, kind of like when a container ship comes into port. All those containers do not want to stay in the port. They need to be delivered somewhere else. What Impulse can do is provide the tractor trailer to move that cargo to its real destination in space. As the space industry grows and scientists look to the stars for new resources, Muller believes that near-Earth space is becoming less abstract and far more accessible. It is a frontier he continues to help define, one mission at a time. If you've made it this far, I truly appreciate your time and interest. I'm glad to know this video has been helpful to you. We're on our way to reaching our goal of 10,000 subscribers, so feel free to support us by hitting the subscribe button. It really makes a big difference. Thank you.